The book, The World's Worst Predictions, lists some of history's all-time prophetic goofs. King George II said in 1773 that the American colonies had little stomach for revolution. An official of the White Star Line, speaking of the firm's newly built flagship, the Titanic, launched in 1912, declared that the ship was unsinkable. In 1939, the New York Times said the problem of TV was that people had to glue their eyes to a screen, and the average American wouldn't have time for that. We don't have time for TV. No screens here. An English astronomy professor said in the early 19th century that air travel at high speed would be impossible because passengers would suffocate. We laugh at the way these predictions worked out and sometimes scoff at those who made them. As much failure as there has been with prophetic words, it still draws people. I mean, we'd all like to know what's coming in the future, when it's going to happen, and what's going to happen. I remember a decade ago sitting in my living room on a Friday evening, and there was a group that had spent millions of dollars advertising that Jesus was coming the next day. And as I sat there on Friday evening, thinking about what was being said, I thought, what if? What if Jesus did come tomorrow? Am I ready? Something that keeps us on the tip of our toes. Today, we take a look at this thing called prophecy. So before we go any further, let's ask the Lord continue with us. Father in heaven, we invite your Holy Spirit to remain here with us. Lord, open our hearts and minds to your word. Draw us closer to you. And Lord, help us to learn more of what you would have us to from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we begin a new series that will stretch out until October. Now that sounds like a long ways away, doesn't it? It's just about eight days. (laughs) This series is going to go on in October. Uh, There are many passages in the Bible that we love, many that we love to quote There are many stories of Jesus that we've heard sliced and diced in sermons. There are beautiful passages that bring joy and hope in the midst of despair. And then there are some passages that we really struggle with. Sometimes uh, we don't understand them, so we just dismiss them and say, well, I don't know, whatever. Other times they cause us to lose sleep and sometimes even make us question everything. They aren't, uh, they're, they're passages that sometimes just don't make sense. Now, much of the Bible is very clear, but there are some passages that are challenging and difficult to understand. So today we begin a five-part series looking at difficult passages, trying to understand what the Holy Spirit has inspired to be written. Pastor Mike and I will be addressing some difficult passages and themes that maybe you have struggled with, maybe you have questioned yourself, and we hope that this series will help you to understand the Word of God more clearly. One of the topics that we talk about frequently in the Seventh-day Adventist church is this thing called prophecy. Uh, We study the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. We identify the beasts and powers. We study prophetic time. Prophecy is important to us. Some prophecies in the Old Testament, however, have not been fulfilled. And this creates a tension Because as we look at prophecy, we also look at Revelation that says, in the last days there will be false prophets. And if there's false prophets, then there will also be true prophets, and we don't want to be deceived. We want to make sure we understand what is right and what is wrong. And so when prophecy in the Bible is not fulfilled, it creates a tension for us. Today, the term prophet has a very narrow scope. When we hear the word prophet... We think of foretelling the future. The prophet's going to tell us what's going to happen next. They're going to tell us some great cataclysmic event or or some event that's going to happen in this city or that or to this person or that. That's what we tend to think of when we think of prophecy. But that's a much narrower scope than how the Bible uses the term prophet. So let's look at what does the Bible say about a prophet in Scripture? Let's first look at uh, how the Bible describes it. We're going to look at the Hebrew word just briefly. The Hebrew word for prophet is navi, and it's translated as spokesman, speaker, 
or prophet. Spokesman, speaker, or prophet. So you can see the Bible uses a little bit broader definition than what we may consider today. A prophet is simply one who speaks for God. Now you may say, well, preacher, I don't believe that. Show me. All right, we'll do it. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. Here God says, I will raise up for them a what? Prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So here we see that a prophet is one who says says what what God God tells them to say. They're a spokesperson for God. That is what a prophet is. Much of the time in the Old Testament, prophets were speaking about things like social justice, lack of ethics, and religious formalism. They were teaching the people of God, not necessarily foretelling what was to come in the future. Though there are many prophecies in the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, prophets were more concerned about speaking what God told them to say than giving predictions. Today, some claim to speak for God. Oh, God told me, and I'm supposed to tell you, right? Right? It happens frequently, and sometimes this responsibility of speaking for God is taken very lightly, maybe even flippantly. In Old Testament times, to speak on behalf of God was a sacred duty. Someone uh, someone would not dare to claim to speak for God unless God had spoken to them. It was such a sacred position that if someone claimed to speak for God without being called and empowered by him, they were considered false prophets and were to be killed. So the role of prophet was held very highly with great esteem. Now, let's review quickly the signs of a true prophet. First of all, the Bible tells us that a true prophet will be faithful to the Bible. If a prophet comes along and says, oh yeah, the Bible says, but you can forget that. This is what you're supposed to do. The Bible says, no, no, no. That is not a true prophet. We read in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, to the word of God, If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So the first indicator of a true or false prophet is if they speak according to Scripture, if they're faithful to the Bible. Secondly, a true prophet will lift Jesus up. John the Baptist said in John 3.30, He must increase, speaking of Jesus, I must decrease. A true prophet of God will lift Jesus up. They won't say, oh, Jesus was a good teacher. Jesus was a good guy. He he gave some good teachings that you can listen to. No, they will lift Jesus up as God. So a uh, true prophet will be faithful to the Bible. They will lift Jesus up, and they will also bear good fruit. Jesus said in Matthew 7, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. A true prophet will not lead people in rebellion to the word of God. They will lead them in accordance with the word of God. Now, sometimes following God's word may end up being in rebellion, but not for the sake of rebellion. So a true prophet will lift up the word of God and it will be evident in their life that they are working on behalf of God. A fourth sign is that prophecies given by a true prophet will come to be fulfilled. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And then Jeremiah 28, verse 9, As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So if a prophet speaks and the thing doesn't come to pass, he is not a true prophet. And this is what begins to make us a little uncomfortable when we look at prophecies in the Old Testament that have not been fulfilled. It creates a little tension for us. Well, wait a second. The Bible says that those prophecies have to come true. So if they don't, what is going on? How do we deal with prophecy that does not find fulfillment? Should we disregard the prophet? Should we toss out the book? What are we to do 
with unfulfilled prophecy. Let's consider a couple of prophecies in the Old Testament. First, we consider Isaiah chapter 60 through 66. Now, obviously, we're not going to take time to read six chapters this morning or do a study on that. We could be here the rest of the day. But in these chapters, uh, it talks about the future glory of Israel. Now, this is at a time after they've gone into, uh, they've been rebellious and they're just not doing well. And there is this prophecy of the future glory of Israel. Now, there are a number of passages in this section that you are very familiar with. Uh, the words that Jesus repeated in Isaiah 61, where he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. That comes from Isaiah 61. Uh, then there's a promise we cling to in Isaiah chapter 65. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65. And then the picture of us all worshiping before the Lord in Isaiah 66, verses 23 and 24. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. Beautiful passages, encouraging passages. The imagery found in these passages is fantastic, but these prophecies were not fulfilled in Israel's time, nor have they been fulfilled today. They're promises we cling to, but that have not found their fulfillment. So is Isaiah, therefore, a false prophet? Another example that we see is in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. It's talking about the glory of the temple of God. Now, in these chapters, Ezekiel uh, uh, said, said he, he was, was taken by God to see the temple. And we find in the following chapters descriptions of the glory and grandeur of the temple. Now, Solomon had built a beautiful temple before, but it never regained the glory or splendor even after these words given by Ezekiel. So was he a false prophet? Should we disregard the book of Ezekiel? We read something in the book of Jeremiah that sheds light on the concept of prophecy given in Scripture. We read in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 2, uh, Jeremiah is told by the Lord, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. So Jeremiah follows the word of the Lord. He gets, gets up and he goes, goes down the street, down to the potter's house. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a potter work or if some of you may be potters. Um, watching a potter work is phenomenal. It's not a job. It's an art form. You know, they, they start the wheel spinning, maybe with their hand or maybe with their foot. And they take that big old lump of clay, smash it on there, and they get their hands wet and they begin to work that clay, making it nice and round. They can, they can raise it up nice and tall. They can flatten it. They can form it. They can raise it up again. They can make a pitcher or a cup or a bowl or a plate. They can make anything they want to with it. And so Jeremiah is there watching the potter work that clay. And as he was watching uh, the potter, uh, there, was, there was something wrong with the piece that he was working on. So the potter smashed the piece, put it back together, started spinning it again, and made it into something else, something that he saw fit to make. Then the Lord speaks to Jeremiah in verses 6 through 10 and says, O house of Israel, can, can I, I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look at the clay as it's in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil... I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. If it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said would benefit it. We see here something we call conditional prophecy. You see, human response can impact the fulfillment of general prophecy when it applies to specific individuals or even nations. We make a difference even to God, even to in some cases, to prophecy. Another great example of the human response is in the story about a city by the name of Nineveh. You remember this wicked city, right? It, it was a terrible place, had a horrible reputation, and God sought to change things in the city. And so he reached out to his, one of his prophets, and he said, hey, I want you to go to this city called Nineveh and tell them to repent. And the prophet said, no way. And he took off in the opposite direction. And it just so happened that a big old storm came up on the sea. And uh, the prophet said, yep, my fault. They threw him overboard and a big fish swallowed him. 
Of course, we know this is the story of Jonah. God called his prophet to go give a prophecy to the people in Nineveh. Eventually, Jonah does go to Nineveh and he tells the people, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, number one, this is not a popular message. I mean, what if you were called to go over to McCall and say, hey, you guys are going to be wiped out. You going to make many friends in McCall? You going to win over people? No, not a popular message. And Nineveh is described as a wicked city. So not only do you have an unpopular message, you're going to a group of wicked people who would probably love to slice and dice you. But after three days in the dark of the sea and a big fish, Jonah thinks it's probably not a bad idea. So he goes and does what God asks him to do. He goes to the city of Nineveh and he tells them, hey, 40 days and you guys are done. And notice what happens next. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Let me stop there for just a moment. Jonah went to a wicked city. These were not people who loved God. These were not people who followed God. They were given a terrifying message, and they believed God. How often do believers fail to believe God? And this whole wicked city believed him. So the message is given, Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them, then the word came to the king of Nineveh. Oh, buck stops here. And he caused it to be proclaimed. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? This evil, wicked king tells his people, maybe God will listen to us. Maybe God will change his mind. Maybe God will relent. Maybe he won't vaporize our city. How phenomenal. Not just the wicked people, but the wicked king. Jonah brought the message to the people, and the people listened. Everyone fasted and repented in hopes that God would not destroy them. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The good news that we find in this story is that if the person or the people change their ways in conditional prophecy, they can change the outcome. Human choice can have a bearing on prophecy. This highlights our human freedom. Some want to say that, that we're either doomed or we're headed to paradise and there's nothing you can do about it. But the Bible simply doesn't support that concept. We have choice. And our choice makes a difference. Israel was a unique example. Though it was a spiritual nation, it was also a political and national entity. God made covenantal promises to bless them. So long as they kept their end of the bargain, God would do the things he covenanted to. But if the people neglected their responsibility, God would not fulfill his end of the deal and even bring curses on them. And this is what we see in both Isaiah 60 to 66 and Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48. In these cases, God promised to do something in the context of Israel remaining faithful to him. And when Israel prostituted herself with foreign gods, they forfeited the blessings of God because of their choices. Those prophecies were not fulfilled because they walked away from God. We see time and again Israel turning away from God. Time and again God sent prophets to try and bring Israel back. But finally at the end of the 8th century BC, the northern kingdom of Israel disappeared and only 150 years later, the rest of Israel fell. The whole nation ceased to be because they would not heed the word of God. 
In all honesty, God was exceedingly patient with Israel, wasn't he? Think of their history. Time after time after time, they turned away from God. They started worshiping foreign gods. They let them run their country. And time after time after time, God forgave their sin. He continued to send prophets to call them back. And as they continued to walk away, they reaped what they had sowed. Their ultimate demise was as a result of their choices to ignore God, to walk away from Him. Now, to be clear, though some prophecy is conditional, such as the examples we've looked at today, there is also something called apocalyptic prophecy, prophecy about the coming of Jesus, the end times, and that is not conditional. It's going to happen no matter what. You can choose to follow Jesus or not to follow Jesus, and it doesn't matter because the end is coming. It's just a matter on which side of the situation you're going to be on. No human can stop it. Not even the devil can stop the final events. Brothers and sisters, there are difficult passages in Scripture. There are times when we read Scripture and we just don't understand what's being said. In that case, we have to study diligently, ask the Holy Spirit for guidance to understand what He has had written. Today we've looked at unfulfilled prophecy and our impact on it. Ultimately, God loves us and values how we respond to Him. And this is just one example of why we need to study Scripture even when we don't understand something. When we don't understand, don't get discouraged. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But pray, study, seek additional help. Be patient and wait on the Lord. He will make sense of everything. And when there are cases that we just can't figure out, sometimes we have to move forward in faith. Because of the walk we've had with Jesus, we know his character. We know his love for mankind. And so we can, by faith, take some of these things we don't understand and say, I don't get it, but I know that God loves me and I know he's going to work it out and he'll reveal it to me when I need to know. So be patient. Wait on the Lord. He will make sense of it. When there seems to be unfulfilled prophecy, instead of writing God off, dig deeper into the Word of God. Trust the character of God. And remember, by following Jesus, we may impact how things work out in our lives, even if we fear the worst. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for these difficult passages of Scripture, those things that make us scratch our heads, the things that maybe even make us question you because it causes us to fall more completely on you. Lord, we ask that you will help us to understand those difficult passages of Scripture. May we continue to walk with you day by day and may you reveal to us what we need to know in this moment and may we trust the future with you. We love you. We ask that you be with us as we go into this next week. Thank you for this time we've had together, Lord. Draw us close to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.